All right, so if we want to review all of Unit 7, which we do, all we need to do is talk about five people, President Madison, President Monroe, President John Quincy Adams, President Andrew Jackson, and then Chief Justice of the Supreme Court during this entire time, Chief Justice John Marshall. And if we talk about what each of these guys does and why, is it, why their presidencies or time is important, then we've covered all of Unit 7. So let's go ahead and get started with President James Madison elected after Thomas Jefferson. Now, when James Madison becomes president, we've got a lot of tension between the United States and Britain that's going to lead us to the War of 1812. So let's talk about those two things that are going on. Item number one is British, we'll just put a B, impressment. So the British are impressing our sailors and they won't stop. They've been doing this since George Washington was president and we're angry about it. Now, item number two over here, item number two is the British are still arming the natives on the Western frontier. So the British are kidnapping our sailors and the British are also giving the Native Americans in our Western frontier guns so that they can attack us and kill us. So these two things combine with another element, and that is the election of some new guys to Congress. We get war hawks joining Congress. Remember, war hawks are people who want to go to war with Britain, and there are two main ones. The two main war hawks are, remember, Henry Clay, so H. Clay, and John C. Calhoun, so J. C. Calhoun, are the two main war hawks. And so combining these two motivations, we're mad at Britain, these guys want us to go to war, combining all of those things leads us to the War of 1812. Now, the War of 1812 is really fought in three different areas. It's fought in the east, it's fought in the west, and it's fought in the south. So first we're going to start with the war in the west. And the war in the West is basically two guys going head to head. We have Harrison, William Henry, right? So we got Harrison versus who? Who's that Native American leader who unites the tribe? That's Tecumseh. So we have Harrison versus Tecumseh. And there's really one major battle that we need to remember from the West. And that's the battle that takes place at... Tippecanoe, the Battle of Tippecanoe. So we're going to put a triangle and a line here, and we're going to write Tippecanoe on top. Now, why have I put it on a teeter-totter? Why is it teetering? Because Tippecanoe is the tipping point for the war in the West. It tips towards William Henry Harrison because he wins that battle. And after that time, the Native Americans are never that powerful again. So William Henry Harrison versus Tecumseh. William Henry, Henry Harrison wins at the Battle of Tippecanoe. That's the war in the West. So now let's focus to the war in the East. To do this, we really have two main things that you need to know about from this class. The first one is when the British arrive in Washington. And when the British arrive in Washington, as we've talked about, what do they do to the city? They burn it. They burn Washington. So we're just going to put Washington in flames to remind us that what do they do to it? It's burned. I hope that looks enough like flames to convince you that we burned Washington and to remind you what was going on. After the British burned Washington, hopefully you remember that they head down south and they go to Baltimore, but the fort that they attack is called Fort McHenry. M-C-H-E-N-R-Y, Fort McHenry. And you'll remember that Fort McHenry is in the harbor at Baltimore protecting the city. And so the British begin to bombard Fort McHenry. And there's this guy. He's a prisoner. And he's on a boat. And he is watching the whole thing happen. See him pointing at it? He's trying to see what's going on. And he's thinking to himself, oh, say, can you see? Question mark. Because he's trying to know, can you see the flag? Can you see what's flying? Is it the American flag or the British flag? Who's winning? Because this guy writes what? He writes the Star Spangled Banner. And his name is what? Star Spangled Banner. His name is, what is his name? Can you remember? Francis Scott Key. 
So Francis Scott Key. So we need to remember Francis Scott Key at the Battle of Fort McHenry, he writes the Star Spangled Banner about what's going on. So that's the war in the East. Finally, the war in the South. And the war in the South also can be broken into two events. They're both battles. The first one is Andrew Jackson versus the Creeks. And that takes place at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend. So go ahead and label that. Horseshoe Bend. Remember the bend in the river. And who wins that one? That's Andrew Jackson. And then he goes on to fight one more battle, and it's Jackson against the British. This is the last battle of the war, after the peace treaty has been signed. And it is fought at this location. It is fought at New Orleans, Louisiana, or as you may know it, NOLA. And who wins that battle? Once again, that is Andrew Jackson. He becomes known as the hero of New Orleans, sometimes known as Old Hickory. And so that basically brings the War of 1812 to an end, and we've talked about most of James Madison's presidency. Now, after James Madison is president, we elect a new guy, and his name is James Monroe. And James Monroe's presidency is known as the era of what? That's right, era of good feelings. So we're going to put that off to the side. And the main event of James Monroe's presidency has to do with the entire Americas. Because remember, what we're seeing at this time is that these colonies want to be free. So we'll say, we want independence. Because they've looked at the War of American Independence, they've looked at the French Revolution, all these other things. These southern colonies in the Americas want to be free. So they declare independence. James Monroe likes this because we're able to trade directly with these nations. So we're able to trade with them, and that's giving us a lot of money, and we like that, so we want them to remain free. So in order to make sure this happens, we get James Monroe here. So we're just going to draw a quick person. Uh, try not to mock me too much as I quickly, you know, speed through this. Uh, okay, so let's give him a apparently a really small head. We'll give him a superhero logo. And uh, let's give him a cape. Because he's flying, right? And his James Monroe. But what is he holding? This is, remember, this is the doctrine. That is the Monroe Doctrine. And the Monroe Doctrine basically says what to Europe? It says, stay out of the Americas. That is the message that he sends to all of Europe. He says, your time here in the Americas is over. These colonies will be independent and you need to stay out. That is the main event from James Monroe's presidency is the Monroe Doctrine right up here. The era of good feelings, the Monroe Doctrine, telling people that what they need to stay out of the Americas. So let's go ahead and move on to John Quincy Adams. John Quincy Adams is elected in what year? This is the election of 1824, almost 200 years ago, real close to that. And the election of 1824 is fought between two guys. So let's just kind of quickly sketch them out. We got one guy over here, um, and then we've got another guy over here. We give him like angry anime eyes, okay? Because he's gonna be mad. Give him the angry mouth. And uh, we'll have him pointing. Okay, so this first guy, this is gonna be Adams. This is gonna be, you guys know, this is gonna be Andrew Jackson. So why is Andrew Jackson so mad over here? Well, as I'm sure you remember, in this election, these two guys are running against each other. And in this election, who gets the most votes? The guy who gets the most votes is actually Andrew Jackson. He gets the most votes, but not enough to win. And so it goes to the House of Representatives, 
and Henry Clay throws his support behind John Quincy Adams, and John Quincy Adams becomes president. And so we're actually gonna put a little mask over this guy because of what Andrew Jackson says about this election. Andrew Jackson says about this election, he says it is a what? He calls it a corrupt bargain or a bad deal. He says it's a cheat. And so he points to Andrew Jackson, or he points to John Quincy Adams, and he says that you should not have been president. It shouldn't have happened. You cheated. This is a corrupt bargain. You stole the election. I should be president. And so basically, Andrew Jackson runs around the nation for the entire time that John Quincy is president. And he basically says, this is a stolen election. It's a cheat. Uh, John Adams, John Quincy Adams should not be president. And the American people listen. And so we have them saying stuff like, you know, we don't want, we don't trust him. That's what some people say. Some people say that Henry Clay cheated. That Clay helped him become president so he could be the Secretary of State. Some people say that. And then some people say, you know what? We actually, we want Jackson. A lot of people did. He had the popular vote. And so all during John Quincy Adams' presidency, his entire presidency is overshadowed by this, the corrupt bargain. And so he has a very ineffective presidency. So when he's done, Andrew Jackson runs again. He's easily elected. Andrew Jackson has a nickname down here. Let's go ahead and put it. He is known as AKA Old Hickory because he is kind of old, but he is tough as nails. Andrew Jackson is incredibly influential, so much so that the 20 years after his election is known as, so this whole large period of time is known as the what? It is known as the age of Jackson. So go ahead and put that down. It's known as the age of Jackson. Now, Andrew Jackson's presidency can really be boiled down into five victories for the common people. These are victories for only Americans. Not victories for the whole world, but victories for Americans. So, let's first talk about victory number one. We're going to call this one the widening of democracy. So, number one, first victory for the common people is this. Democracy widens. And let's go ahead and list some examples of ways that democracy widens, okay? So, um, number one, more people can vote. More people can vote. Now, is it enough that they can vote? No, we know that. It's not enough to be able to vote. What's also important is that more people do vote. Okay, so that's two examples. We could list a lot, but we'll just list three. More people can vote, more people do vote, uh, and then people participate in politics. So people are getting involved. They're getting some skin in the game. They're participating in uh, elections, the, uh, campaigns, things like that. They're helping people get elected. So that's item number one, democ democracy widens. Now, item number two, I'm going to change colors to make it easy to see. Item number two is one of the big victories here is that Andrew Jackson was a common man. So that's a victory because people look at Jackson and they think he's just like us. He was born from nothing. To quote Drake, he started at the bottom, now he's here. So this is a big deal because people look to the White House and they finally see someone that they can identify with, someone who's similar to them. So let's put some people down here really quickly and we'll have them saying, he's like us. He's a common man, that's a big deal, okay? So that's victory number two. We're gonna go back to the color black for a moment for victory number three. With victory number three is that Andrew Jackson kills the bank. Remember, the bank was good for the rich, but it wasn't good for the average people. It didn't benefit them. So we're gonna draw a bank here.
we'll say that looks like a bank. And then we got Andrew Jackson coming over. So just kind of draw a person real quick. Give him a sword. Uh, apparently a really big sword. Excuse me there. And what is this sword really? What is his weapon? His weapon is the veto. Because how does he kill the bank? He kills it with the veto. So that is the U.S. bank killed by Andrew Jackson with the veto. Now, the fourth victory is basically between South Carolina and Andrew Jackson, and this is the nullification crisis. The nullification crisis. And the crisis is basically fought over tariffs. So we'll put the word tariffs down here, and we'll put a guy here, this is gonna be Andrew Jackson, versus the state of South Carolina. And so with Andrew Jackson and this versus the state of South Carolina, South Carolina is saying, we don't like tariffs. And how does Andrew Jackson respond? We'll put this in a different color. Andrew Jackson responds with, you can't secede or you can't leave the nation. You have to listen. And so Andrew Jackson faces down South Carolina with the nullification crisis. And this last victory for the common people, you're not going to like that I call it a victory because this is a dark chapter in Andrew Jackson's presidency. But you have to remember that in reality, it may not be a good thing, but it does give the United States a lot more land. So we don't like this event in history, but because it allows Southern farmers to gain more land and farm more, it would be considered by them as a victory. And that, of course, is the Trail of Tears. And so the tribes that left would not have lived in teepees, but it does make it easier for us to draw. So we're gonna go ahead and do it that way just for our ease, not because it's accurate. And with the Trail of Tears, you've got the United States Army and they're standing here and they're ordering them out. And then what you see is the natives having to leave. And so what you can do here is when you're drawing these stick figures, give them a nice bent back. And that's gonna remind you that they are not wanting to leave, that they are depressed and dejected and beaten. And so they go west where? To Oklahoma or to Indian territory. So those are the five victories for the common people or victories for the people. We don't like all of them, but they do all directly benefit the people of the United States. So we've got Andrew Jackson and his presidency basically broken down into those five events. And then last, we've got Chief Justice John Marshall. There's a lot of stuff he does, but these are the three that we need to remind ourselves about. So let's start out with Gibbons versus Ogden. <coughs> First of all, Let's just remind ourselves what this court case is about. This is the one about the steamship that had the monopoly between New York and New Jersey. And so what this court case says is no monopolies on trade. Okay, so that's kind of the main point of that one. Uh, and the real lesson it says is why can't they do that? Because the Fed or the federal government controls trade. Now, how do we remember that Gibbons versus Ogden is about the Monopoly? If you've ever played Monopoly, one of the big components of it is when you pass Go, G-O, Gibbons versus Ogden. So hopefully remembering that and passing Go will remind you, oh yeah, this is about the Monopoly and trade and the federal government controls trade. Or to use the vocab, not trade, but interstate what? Interstate commerce. You'll need to think of it that way. Next court case, McCulloch versus Maryland. This is all about the U.S. bank. Remember, Maryland is trying to tax it, and that basically is not going to be okay. So what this court case says is that states can't tax the bank because the bank is part of the United States government. So how do we remember what this one is about? Well, when you look at the name McCulloch, 
it kind of has the word lock in it right here. And so if you think about it, what types of things do you lock up? Well, you lock up your money. So this court case, McCulloch versus Maryland, is about the money. It's the one about the bank. Last court case here, Worcester versus Georgia. This is when um, the Cherokee are trying to keep from having to walk the Trail of Tears to keep from being kicked off their land. And this court case famously says that states cannot ignore uh, federal treaties. So what I want you to see is that each of these court cases is different, but they all do the same thing, okay? They have a similarity because they all do this. They all strengthen the federal government. Every single one of them. So I hope you've been keeping up with me as we went along. I hope you have this sheet completed and ready to turn in. Go ahead and do so now, now that you're done with it. Save yourself the hassle of doing it later. And be sure to review this because sometimes it's helpful to view things visually in order to remember what it is that we actually talked about. See you next time.